Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Join us on benpokolsky.com to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life. What's up, ladies and gents? Ben Pokolsky podcast. And today we're going to dive deep with the director of examine.com, the website that is known for giving us the no BS down low on supplements. Um, examine is known for giving you all of the research backed information uh, on every supplement in every genre that you can imagine. And today I'm interviewing the director, Mr. Kamal Patel. He is a seven-year PhD student uh, whose brain is absolutely phenomenal. And he goes down some rabbit holes about chronic pain and how to influence them with nutrition, some of the strange unknown protocols and drugs that he's tried to eliminate his pain. Uh, we get into a little bit about nootropics uh, because obviously I'm very focused now on longevity and optimization of my life. I want to have my brain functioning like a 18-year-old when I'm 118. I'm, so I'm really wanting to understand how the body works, and Kamal does a really good job of giving us some deep dives. Um, so you're going to want to take out the pen and paper again. Get ready. This is a long one. There's a lot of information, but Kamal Patel is a wealth of valuable information. And of course, if you love this, I want you to share it with one person who you think can benefit. We all know someone who's got chronic pain and Kamal Patel's information is absolutely something they need to hear. So thanks very much, guys. Enjoy the show. What's up, ladies and gents? Ben Pokolsky podcast. I've got a great guest as always today. We're going to dive deep on supplements, on nutrition, on how they influence in chronic pain. My guest today is Mr. Kamal Patel, and you may know him from examine.com, a resource I use literally every day uh, as I'm, you know, kind of finding my way through the vast, overwhelming supplement industry. Kamal, welcome. It's my pleasure. Yeah, man. My pleasure is all mine for sure. So tell me about, uh, you know, you just started telling me, about, tell me how you got in, ex involved in examine.com and, um, you know, why people should go to that website. So back in 2011 or so, um, I was working on a project looking at how nutrition and elimination diets impact people with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is one of the mm -hmm. pain conditions that is usually most responsive to nutrition. But even with doctors knowing that, there were never good studies being done. So uh, my PhD research back then was on that. And I ran a personal website called Pain Database, which might or might not still be up. But um, it was just because I, I had pain issues of my own. Um, I used to be a wannabe power lifter. <laughs> I, I kind of went from, uh, from no muscle to um, kind of uh, gaining too much muscle for my system. And specifically, it was because um, I had a connective tissue disorder that was undiagnosed, uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So anyway, the uh, the other co-founder of Exam and Saul uh, also has Ehlers-Danlos by you know some Hilarious. crazy, yeah, that, right. funny how that kind of stuff happened. So yeah. he came across my website. He was like, you know, I like websites like this that kind of go uh, heavy into research. Um, you know, if any of your listeners like these kind of websites, you probably know like Wirecutter if you like gadgets. Uh, you know, some uh, different news websites like Vox, if you want to get into like stats and stuff. And just uh, there are some websites that go really in depth about stuff. And Examiner was one of those. So I helped them out at first and then uh, they needed somebody to run the whole thing. And, and I was around. So so that's how I got started. And and basically, I, I was interested in muscle gain from uh, from back when because I had to try to cut down to 170 and um, and I started, uh, I think, maxing at around 50 pounds on um, on bench when I was 19 years old. So that was uh, 1998 when there wasn't much on the internet except for bodybuilding.com and maybe TMAG or T-Nation or whatever it was called back then. So, you know, I Googled stuff, but I couldn't figure things out. And I almost gave it up because I was so embarrassed at how little I was lifting. And then just randomly, this guy who lived next to me in the dorm was a power lifter and a very good one. So... 
at the time he was the uh, what is it 242 or whatever um, amateur record holder in the in the deadlift for his age category. So uh, everybody was scared of him, but he was you know a gentle giant type. And I just asked him straight up, what's most important? Uh, and he laid it out for me. I mean, we didn't go lifting together. He just basically gave me a lecture. Sure. So I started from day two focusing on nutrition because I knew that what you did in the kitchen was much more important than what you did at the gym. And, uh, and fast forward almost 20 years now, and I basically just read studies all day, and that's my job. Where are you finding most of your research right now? Is it all PubMed? Uh, it's mostly all PubMed. Uh, what I like to do for my, my own kind of interest is uh, compare randomized trials from PubMed um, against case studies and other kind of lower quality evidence um, against anecdotes from forums. And I know, you know, people kind of crap on experiences in forums, but I think it's really important because, um, you know, if you look between like 1990 and 2000, 2010, uh, more and more people started to be like, hey, you know, that's not supported by meta-analysis. Um, and having done meta-analysis for vitamin D and fructose and some other things, I used to be like that too. But people don't realize there's not much research out there. Absolutely. You know, if you take a given supplement or a given nutrient or a given diet, there is only enough money to fund maybe like one or two high quality trials for most of those things. And then when you get higher on the evidence hierarchy, uh, there's even less stuff. So when you do a meta-analysis of, for example, vitamin D and muscle gain, you're gonna trim the number of randomized trials down from like 50 down to 20. And then now they started doing these reviews called umbrella reviews, where they review a bunch of different meta-analyses. So they're reviewing different reviews. And once you get to that level, you're so far away from the actual people involved in the trials, you lose any granularity. So that's why I like to look at anecdotes, randomized trials, and other types of evidence like case studies and kind of come to my own conclusion. So would examine.com then be a uh, summary of your conclusions or is it a, a combination of the, the data and, and the summary of your conclusions? Uh, examines mostly randomized trial data on humans, and that's because we try to be as safe as possible. So like when I come on podcasts, it's a lot of what's on examine, but some of what's not. Like, you know, we always say before you buy XYZ supplement, try to dial in your diet and your sleep and your stress and all that kind of stuff. But uh, people still go to the website and they're like, well, you know, I need to buy these three nutrients and these three supplements because they have the highest evidence on our human effect matrix. Uh, and we can't avoid that. You know, you'll always want to get a magic bullet pill because and it's not that people are lazy. It's just if you have limited time, if, if you're like working the daily grind in your cubicle, you're not going to go home and want to research for two hours on PubMed to find out what's the best to take. You know, you just go for what you've heard your friends take, you know, what seems to have good evidence, what's in ads. Um, you know, like somebody asked me recently about the Frank Thomas ad that's always on um, about Frank Thomas taking some <laughs> testosterone supplements and then the ladies love him and they're like, you know, should I take that? Right. Uh, you know, that's what people buy. It's only like, uh, you know, people like you, um, when people get into bodybuilding or powerlifting or, you know, CrossFit or whatever, there's some people they look up to and then they mirror those people. And for 95% of the cases, that's safe. But then for the 5%, there's other things that people might want to try. And that gets kind of lost because uh, people aren't aware of the evidence, like uh, infrared saunas. You know, it's not a nutrition thing, but for that 5%, it could be helpful. Or um, vitamin D or vitamin C doesn't necessarily help reduce the symptoms um, of colds or the duration of colds, but it could help some things before you get a cold and people don't. Right generally aren't aware of that evidence. So many of my listeners complain and email about, hey man, you know, I've got pain here, I've got pain here. And my first line of defense is, well, let's first eliminate the thing that's causing the pain, right? Which is most often yeah. shitty training. Uh, and, and obviously nutritionally as well. Um, tell me about some of the causes you find nutritionally that are contributing to this chronic pain before we get into things that are curing it or helping it. Yeah, sure. So uh, when it comes to nutrition and chronic pain, um, really the first thing is to not look at nutrition because a lot of people have pretty good diets um, and still have chronic pain. And then other people who have crappy diets, like you said, uh, they just need to live a healthier life. You know, when they start eating better, they'll sleep better and they'll manage their stress better. But uh, when you think about nutrition, 
Don't think about it inductively. Like some people say, you know, let me look at everything to do with vitamin D and chronic pain or everything to do with like uh, carb intake and chronic pain. Rather, I like to look at it deductively. Like, um, have you seen that show Sherlock, no. the BBC show with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch? So he'll like uh, help go to a crime scene and I'll start piecing things together from yep. uh, what's called first principles. So we'll start at ground zero and then build up. Um, so when you do that, then usually looking at diet, you think about what causes pain, what is pain, and how are nutrients involved? So pain is a signal to your body that there's something wrong. When you lift weights, there's always something wrong. Um, but the question is, how is pain interacting with it? So usually um, it'll be something like, you know, you don't do enough pulling, you do too much pushing in the gym, or you do the right stuff at the gym, you have the right posture, but when you get home, then you're uh, in a wrong position or you're in a, in a bad position in your cubicle for too long. So in that case, it would be like, take more micro breaks or use a standing desk a little bit or makeshift standing desk or uh, like, I have crazy joints at this point, like uh, labrum tears in both shoulders and both hips and stuff. So I can't stand that much, but I have this crazy uh, leaning stool thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. So, uh, yeah. you know, it makes it look like there's this stick coming out of my butt. But other than that, it's <laughs> awesome because if you need to change your position, but you can't stand too much for whatever reason, back pain, leg pain, that's one way to go. That's just an aside. But anyway, back to nutrition. If pain is a signal that there's something wrong, then the problem could be with the signal in and of itself. So uh, when you look at humans versus animals, when, a, when an animal experiences pain, like if a deer uh, sprains its deer ankle or breaks its leg or whatever, then uh, what it does is, is it retreats, it sleeps a lot, and it, it kind of uh, doesn't eat enough, which isn't good for its muscle, but it's good for its joint and it, it, because you're not searching for food and you're not um, causing the joint to exacerbate. In humans, the issue is, you know, usually people immobilize for too long. The deer can't do that because the deer still has to get some food. So what humans do is they either go for, uh, you know, rice, uh, rest ice, compression elevation, or kind of the newer thing like meat, uh, mobility, et cetera, et cetera. But they do it arbitrarily. Uh, you know, kind of a, a smarter thing to do is think, you know, how extensive is the damage? Is it, a, is it a chronic pain issue or an acute pain issue? And then go from there. If it's a chronic pain issue, which a lot of people's are, then think about why you might still be having pain. So if pain is a signal, it could be because the signaling is wrong and what's involved in signaling is fatty acids. Yep. So all cells have certain things on the outside of the cell. There's a cell membrane, which is composed of different types of lipids, fatty acids. And then there's stuff outside the cell, carbohydrates, that terminate in some carbohydrate kind of um, signaling thing. So uh, each of those is interesting for different reasons. The cell membrane is interesting because um, you can get an omega-3-6 ratio test done. It's a blood test. Your doctor might you know, not know what that is, but uh, I think it might cost 100, 150 bucks. I'm not saying everybody has to have it, but if you get it done, and your omega-6 ratio is super high, like 10 to 1, that could be an issue with chronic pain because omega-6s aren't inherently inflammatory, but when they're in an ex extremely high ratio, they are inflammatory. But don't get caught up in trying to totally eliminate omega-6 because omega-6s are necessary as an essential fat. Um, and also arachidonic acid and omega-6 might actually be a muscle-boosting supplement. Uh, the evidence is still preliminary at this point, but um, omega-6s aren't bad. It's mostly just the ratio and the absolute amounts. So it could be that your signaling is off. And if that's the case, you really have to dial in your diet for more than a month or two because the amount of turnover in our lipids comes from the turnover in our adipose tissue. And that takes months. You know, you can't just burn your fat, burn away the omega-6 yep. and incorporate new omega-3 in a week. You have to do it over the course of many weeks. So uh, if the signaling is an issue, an issue could be inflammation and oxidation. So before before we move on to inflammation and oxidation, what, what are some of the key things that are going to be influencing signaling? Um, what can people do to, to perhaps, you know, you said mentioned just changing omega-3s. Is there any other supplements we know that can, that can influence signaling? Yeah, so the number one supplement is protein. And that's because neurotransmitters need amino acids for optimal production, just like any chemical. If you don't eat right or don't eat the right kind of protein, uh, you're more predisposed to being depressed, but you're also more predisposed to having pain. And that's why um, 
Fibromyalgia is considered a condition of like 40 to 60 year old women really, but more and more men have it. And the reason why doctors used to think that it was an imaginary condition is that they would just keep seeing these women over and over again that had uh, muscle aches. And they're like, you know, maybe it's because you're not going outside enough here, you're not exercising. But uh, it's not imaginary. It turns out that uh, women with fibromyalgia have different blood markers than women without. And the reason why more men are getting it now is some men who don't get enough protein because they're vegan or vegetarian, and that's nothing against vegan or vegetarian. Um, you know, I've been vegan or vegetarian in the past, and from an ethical standpoint, I think, you know, it's potentially a great diet, but it's just hard to keep track of nutrients if you're not somewhat familiar with nutrition. And if you're not getting enough certain amino acids, then that could be a limiting factor. Um, another factor is potentially um, having kind of a, uh, have you ever done like a targeted ketogenic diet or a cyclical ketogenic diet? Or, yeah. So um, I love doing a variety of diets and, you know, tracking my, you know, DEXA results and, you know, uh, right. and I'll also do other more stupid things like having my own supplements and, you know, and capping my own placebo and just uh, things that nobody should ever do because it's not worth it. But what I've noticed for myself is when I do something like a cyclical ketogenic diet and then I switch to a normal uh, kind of like 100 to 300 carb diet, then I'm more likely to have mood issues. And when you have more mood issues, then you're more likely to exacerbate your pain issues. So what I think, not from evidence, but from my own experience is that um, cyclical or yo-yo dieting, it's called cyclical if you know what you're doing and yo-yo if you don't basically. But if you do that a lot, I think you're more predisposed to having pain issues because um, I don't have evidence for this, but your body relies on some, um, some kind of you know, uh, diurnal cycles or circadian rhythms and that kind of stuff. And if you get into the habit of you do a diet, you lose a bunch of fat, um, and then you do another diet and then, you know, it's not like bulking and cutting, but just trying crazy diets. Also what goes along with that usually is your sleep differs. Sure. Some people find that if they go to sleep on an empty stomach, they sleep worse. If they go to sleep taking like a, a tablespoon of honey and like some casein, then they sleep better. You know, it really varies by the person. Um, and I find that people who have kind of consistent dietary protocols tend to be less susceptible to chronic pain. And it's confounded by a bunch of other factors, but I find that that's one of them. So protein, your dieting, um, and your uh, fatty acid intake are three things I would say. Are there are, are, are particular couple amino acids that people should be paying attention to when it comes to um, this chronic pain consideration, this nerve pain consideration, or is it just protein intake in general? Uh, so anecdotally, I'd say um, it's less so for signaling, but it's more so for the um, composition of muscle and collagen, it would be the smaller amino acids like glycine. So, uh, you know, bone broth is a big paleo thing. And um, and I think it's a little underrated and overrated at the same time. So a few years ago, I was helping to run the paleo conference. And it's it's interesting because I don't really, like really eat paleo, so to speak, but it's because um, I don't think any, any kind of name diet is usually that great. But uh, humans used to eat more glycine because when you eat an animal, you tend to use all of the animal if you're low on food. Sure. Uh, but if you're not low on food like we are, you eat muscle meat because it tastes really good and you don't have to prepare it that much. So um, connective tissue from animals contains a lot of glycine, proline, hydroxyproline. Um, and if you either eat kind of whole animal, like if you kind of uh, roast a chicken or slow cook a chicken and you get some of that leaching into the, the broth, that's good. But if you only eat chicken breast, you're not going to get much of these other nutrients. And the issue is not really getting enough. It's that if you have chronic pain, you want to get more than enough. And, uh, and this has to do with availability of those nutrients. So you're still going to get those amino acids. You're still going to have sufficient collagen production. But you, what you might not get is a therapeutic dose. So this is kind of analogous to BCAAs. So we say on our website that BCAAs for most people are not helpful. And which is true. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're trying to build a maximal amount of muscle, if you're a, a, a competitive bodybuilder, a powerlifter, then it might be helpful to take a little bit of leucine um, yeah. before meals because then that leucine does not compete with other amino acids for absorption and you get a leucine spike. So similarly, if you take hydrolyzed collagen before a workout or before PT or something along with vitamin C, then you can get a spike in glycine and some other amino acids that are important for joint recovery. And vitamin C also helps with collagen synthesis. 
and you get that right before. Whereas if you have like whey protein or animal meat, then you're not getting that spike in glycine. Man, I love where you're going with that. You know, the idea of nutrient timing is one of those things that I'm super aware of as a pro athlete for a long time. And the necessity of doing things like taking some BCAAs or leucine before a meal. Um, is, is there a lot of research in that area? Because I know the, you know the whole if it fits your macros crew doesn't like when we talk about nutrient timing mattering. But I love, you know, even the idea of taking that collagen with vitamin C. Tell me about that and, and how uh, that's going to shape someone's ability to potentially synthesize um, collagen tissue. So uh, most people don't know about this because I think there's only been one good trial on this and it was a year, year and a half ago. Um, and I think they tested um, collagen synthesis after like uh, um, some kind of uh, isometric or like isolated knee exercise. But uh, basically it was a well-designed trial and it showed increased collagen synthesis. Um, for nutrient timing for other stuff, it's tough because often they'll make the wrong comparison. So they'll do like leucine or BCAA uh, against placebo. But what you want to do is you want to do leucine or BCAA against an equal amount of amino acids from whey. And Something else, true. Yeah, it, it's really rare to do that. So uh, what I say to people is, you know, kind of come to terms with what your goals are. So um, if you're not, uh, you know, actually below 10% body fat, like DEXA verified or hydrostatic weighing. Um, and if you're not competing, then don't waste your money, you know? But if you are competing, if you're like, um, if you're going to a beach, you know, and you're, you just really, really want to look extra good. If you're single and you're going to a beach and you want to look extra good, you know, maybe it's worth it to do this for a little bit of time, you know, but, uh, but using leucine or BCA or EAA, um, before every workout or before every meal for an entire year, if you have 15 to 20% body fat is a huge waste of money. Um, people have to realize that they have a, a set amount of budget and a set amount of time and a set amount of adherence to a protocol. So if you're going to adhere to a protocol, then don't adhere to taking certain amino acids at certain times, but do adhere to chinks in your armor, you know, bottlenecks. Sure. So if a bottleneck is sleep, take an effective sleep supplement. If, um, if a bottleneck is stressed, take an effective uh, stress supplement. So people know a lot more about PCAAs than they do like melatonin. Like people know generally something about PCAAs and take- Just because of marketing, right? Ultimately. Yeah. Like marketing is crazy because uh, people are so black and white about it. It's like either supplement companies are evil mm -hmm. or supplement companies, you know, you just buy whatever whatever they say you should take based on a rat study. It's not that at all. Like right. at conferences, I've talked to really smart people from cell phone companies and really smart people who kind of went to the dark side. It just depends on who you are, right? So um, like for supplements, uh, like I was talking to somebody who um, sells melatonin, right? And they sell a melatonin supplement. And the reason they haven't changed it to a sustained release melatonin supplement, which for most people is more beneficial, um, is just because it would take money to reformulate the product, which is fine. But you shouldn't then say this is like the ideal way to take your melatonin. Um, the same is the case with probiotics, with fish oil, with like basically every supplement. And basically that's why we exist because the people who get really in depth will eventually probably find us um, and then find this information. So man, before we get back into that, because I want you to touch on what you just said right there with, with um, you know, people not for reformulating and uh, get into that. I want to ask the question, so as someone who's um, deep into research and looking at all the studies, what percentage of studies that you come across are actually useful? Uh, let's see, it's a tough one. It really depends on the area. So for supplements, um, sports supplements have much worse evidence than general health supplements in terms of quality. And that's because the sports supplement market is growing much faster than the general health supplement market. I think uh, the year over year growth is like 10%. Um, and it's been that way for a little while, whereas for general health supplements, it's closer to 5%. So when there's money to be made, there will be more studies that um, are designed in slightly not optimal way. And it's not because funding from a supplement company makes the study invalid at all. Uh, the way to think about it is, if there's a supplement that's really effective, like creatine, for example, then uh, think back to when creatine first started being popular. You're not going to get uh, government NIH funding for creatine studies back when. So you're going to have to have a supplement maker fund it. So it, it's not at all uh, negating the study. But 
that means that you have to look at the study and uh, who the primary author was, what the uh, trial design was, and whether they did a calculation to see how big the trial needs to be. So the biggest weakness of supplement studies is uh, there will be a study that uh, is only funded enough to have like 25 people in, right? And then like two drop out. And then the study is statistically powered to need like 27 people or something, but they don't mention that they ended up not having enough people. So then they do the study and doesn't invalidate the results, but then at the end, there is a small difference. At the end, we don't know whether the supplement actually helped or not. And then they don't mention previous studies either because they didn't do a systematic review, which most people don't, or certain studies are not published. So back when I worked at this hospital, um, we were also in charge of uh, being the overseers of the clinical trial registry for the US, which is by default the trial registry for the world. So when you do a clinical trial, you have to give your information to clinicaltrials.gov um, and they make sure that your information is all correct. And we found some pretty crazy stuff from this. Um, and this isn't to do with uh, sports nutrition, but kind of starting at the most obvious level, we did this analysis to find out what was the most basic outcome for trials and was that outcome defined the same amongst different trials. So the basic, most basic outcome is death, whether you died or not, because um, it's dichotomous. Either you die or you don't die. It's not like, um, you know, was your mood better or, or how much uh, did you gain in your quads or something? They know if you're dead. But it turns out that when we looked at all these different trials in different areas, they didn't define death in the same way. Some people, if you died, they attributed it always to whatever the intervention was, whether it's a supplement or a drug or a surgery. But that was the minority of studies. For the majority, they either arbitrarily chose that it wasn't attributed to the drug or the uh, supplement or whatever, or they made a personal decision. Like the study author would say, uh, this doesn't look like it's related, and that's it. Nobody would check that conclusion. They would just say, ah, probably not. You know, And that's a problem because there are some drugs, um, especially like antidepressant drugs, where you could be depressed and kind of like foggy headed and get run over by car because of that. And the investigator could say, I don't think so. That person, you know, they were old, so they are probably confused. And this could also happen with certain uh, sports nutrition supplements. And the reason is a little less obvious. So the two reasons are um, liver health, because there's a lot of um, undiagnosed liver issues with people who take a lot of supplements because supplements interact with each other and are metabolized by the liver. Um, and the National Liver Health Registry is not very complete. Um, and then the second thing is kind of crazy herbal combinations. So, uh, you know, DNP, um, dinitrophenol, which uh, is used as a uh, oxidative phosphorylation on copper. So that's the only thing that can actually make you lose fat. Yeah. You know, you probably shouldn't take it. Uh, I'll just say that you should not take it because, you know, yeah. um, I don't want anybody to think anything about examine.com. We don't condone any supplements that are not actually supplements sold in stores. So the thing is, uh, that's the holy grail of fat loss. And some companies or online like powder distributors will try to mimic things that decouple oxidative phosphorylation. So you could still die from a supplement because you're feeling lightheaded or you've sweated so much because you've taken this thing that's trying to mimic DNP or whatever. Um, and then you're walking across the street and you just fall down and faint. It's because of the supplement, you know, it's not because, you know, you're, it's just a hot day. So there's a lot of nitty gritty that gets lost in these trials. And that's why you have to read the study and you can't just go by what the supplement maker says. Sure. So tell me some more common um, issues, I guess, that you see in the supplement industry that people should be concerned with. And, you know, obviously marketing in the U.S. is, you know, you can make a lot of very bold claims um, and people are very guided by marketing. And a lot of times their decisions are, are uh, misguided. And so what are the common the mistakes that you're seeing or the common things people should be aware of? So the first thing people don't uh, really seem to understand is that most supplements nowadays, the, the highest growth potential is in uh, supplement stacks. So if you sell a supplement that's one ingredient and then um, you know it's off patent, then it means anybody else can sell supplement with that ingredient. So for example, curcumin. Um, curcumin has a decent amount of evidence for pain um, and for a variety of other things. But nowadays, if you sell curcumin with black pepper extract, you're gonna lose out in the market because uh, there's a first mover advantage for other companies that have done that. But also there's all these new formulations that don't have black pepper extract that sound fancier. 
So when you when you sell curcumin, then um, the decision is: should I sell curcumin? What preparation should it be? And should I add something to it? And for small companies, the answer is almost always add something to it because if you add something, you gain a leg up. But when you add something to a supplement, then you can either add something that doesn't do anything, add something that negates the effectiveness of the first thing, or add something that burdens your liver. Right. And there's issues there. So like I said, with amino acids, when you start adding things to individual amino acids that could block absorption or at least temporarily the uptake of certain amino acids, um, potentially with things like curcumin, there could be some issues there too. Like um, you can only absorb so much in your gut and the black pepper extract is used to uh, make several things cross the gut. And if you combine curcumin with a few other things and additives, you can possibly make things that you don't want crossing the gut cross the gut. Hmm. And that's why there's this disconnect between the supplement industry and how they portray curcumin. When you see it in ads, they show this powder, this yellow powder, and it's like, look at this uh, ancient elixir from India that people have used as a spice for their amazing food for millennia, which is all true. But there was a certain amount of curcumin that they used because you couldn't eat that much turmeric. It just tastes bad. Sure. So when you use some turmeric, what happens is most of it stays in your gut. And that turmeric stays in your gut and it doesn't help you by crossing through your intestinal wall. What it does is it helps you because it's an anti-inflammatory in your gut. And, right. you know, like Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut, which is not technically true, but um, you could be missing out on some of the benefits of curcumin if you're making all of it go through your gut because a lot of people have uh, bad gut health. So when you start adding stuff, it might actually make your gut health worse if you have some supplement that's curcumin plus this and that and that and that and that. And another area where this comes into play is uh, nootropics, you know, uh, brain boosting supplements. And every year people add more and more stuff to their to those pills. And now there's ones that are like, you know, uh, I don't know if animal pack is still around, but, uh, you know, kind of animal pack type stuff where you're adding a bunch of different pills and, you know, one of those must work. Right. That's not it. The kind of scattershot, grape shot approach to supplementation never works. It's not like if you take all these nootropics then suddenly one of those is going to work it's that you're gonna get a placebo effect almost assuredly, and then you're not gonna know whether it's a placebo effect, and if it worked, you're not gonna know which one worked. So it's better to start from the ground and then build up from there. Come on, how do people know? So obviously you're, you're the guy in the trenches who's doing looking at all the research, but you know I would have never known. I mean, I know a little bit about curcumin and its influences on inflammation in the gut, but I certainly don't know uh, what contraindications are, are gonna be uh, around there, like you know, by adding bioperine, adding something else, I'm not familiar with those inter those interactions. How does someone become uh, familiar with those? Well, uh, you can't know you can't know all those stuff, and I only know a little bit of stuff. You know, I know more than the average person, and that's because you know uh, I have to run examine.com. It's my job, and I have to know these things. So um, I know what I'd like to research, and I know a little bit about everything else. So I, I tend to know a lot about chronic pain, uh, less than I used to about sports supplementation, but a decent amount. And then some little bits about other stuff. But if you have never read studies with a critical eye, it's going to take a lot of time to catch up. So, um, you know, it's hard to get around this because the bar is really high. The best thing to do is um, find people who are evidence-based, kind of look into things that they take and draw your own conclusion. And, uh, you know, our website is good. Like I said, I read our website before I was involved in the website. Um, and then some other things are, uh, so use this inductive approach. So think about if you're, if you're eating and you're eating, let's say to gain muscle, lose fat and sleep better then um, start from the bottom. So a lot of people take a multivitamin, but before they take a multivitamin, 95% of people don't track their micronutrients. So there's only a couple apps, I think, where you can track your micro micronutrient intake. And I don't think like my fitness pal does that, but if you do that for one weekday and one weekend day, then you can get some sense of what you're missing. And for most people who eat healthy, you don't need to take a multivitamin. And it's not even necessarily good insurance, an insurance policy, because um, a multivitamin is based on the same kind of archaic uh, federal government evidence as is our uh, protein guidelines. So like anybody who knows anything knows that you shouldn't follow the federal government guidelines for protein intake if you're 
exercising at all, you know, because they're many years behind with evidence. You know, you look at like uh, what, uh, well, like Stu Phillips does, you know, in Canada out of his lab and you see yep. what, what he says. So similarly, when you look at nutrient intake, don't take a multivitamin unless you're eating crappy, you're in a stressful period and you just need to take something because you're not going to be eating much. Um, or you're just getting into nutrition. Otherwise, look at what you're missing. And usually what people are missing are uh, not vitamins, but minerals. So a lot of people don't get enough magnesium, selenium, uh, iodine. And those are important because vitamins can randomly be in like random shit that you eat and drink. You know, like right. this orange juice has like 100% of all this crazy stuff plus probiotics. Right. And that's just a marketing thing. Uh, but if you look at your nutrient intake, the reason why people don't get a lot of magnesium in their diet is because you can't put that much magnesium in like uh, granola bars or orange juice because magnesium is a bulky nutrient. And you can't just fit a whole bunch of magnesium in a food without it tasting gross. So what supplement makers will do is they'll add magnesium oxide as their main magnesium source, which is absorbed at a 10% or less level usually. Um, and magnesium oxide is actually used as a laxative a lot too. So uh, you don't wanna be taking those and that's a lot of multivitamins. So instead, see what you can eat that has magnesium um, and then see what you can drink. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily advocate for this, but a lot of mineral waters have enough magnesium to uh, quote unquote supplement your diet enough. Um, and then people in areas that have high mineral levels in their water tend to have lower um, heart disease risk and lower risk of depression and suicide. So there's something to be said for this kind of whole foods, holistic approach, but it's not what that like woo woo alternative medicine stuff. It's just that eating stuff is usually a good idea. Uh, what supplements have the greatest amount of research backing when it comes to chronic pain? Uh, so curcumin, turmeric has a lot. Um, fish oil has a decent amount, but it's not, it's not because of fish oil. Um, it's because most people are hugely um, underweighted in omega-3 compared to omega-6, and they just have to try to catch up in any way possible. So five or 10 years ago, there were calculators online where you would put in your body weight and it would say, you know, take 10 grams of fish oil a day, which is nuts. You should never do that because you could have blood thinning if you have certain issues. Um, and also too much omega-3 is not a good thing. Um, a quick kind of like um, perspective on the, on the biochemistry of it is you have a certain amount of fat, you know, and uh, when, when you look at what's in your fat, you should have the same type of fat as somebody who's healthy or an animal that's healthy. And animals tend to have uh, a balance of monounsaturated, saturated, and polyunsaturated fat in their fat tissue. And so do healthy people. And so does breast milk. And so does animal milk. Mm -hmm. But a lot of humans that are not healthy have skewed ratios. So what you want to do is um, less than like, I have chronic pain, time to load up on this uh, fish oil. It's, you're never going to be able to catch up. What you have to do is start with like uh, the supplement of cutting out cheap vegetable oils. That'll do more than any individual lipid supplement will do. Yep. Um, and then uh, t taking the place of that will be a, a certain number of whole foods, like avocado has a bunch of fat, it's great. Coconut has a bunch of fat, it's great. So, um, you know, it's not that saturated fat is a boogeyman or polyunsaturated fat is, fat is bad, like some paleo people say. It's really just that a balance is good and it's hard to have a bad um, fat balance if you're not eating cheap vegetable oils. You could eat almost any other fat and you're fine. So fish oil is good, but not because of fish oil, just because it's catching up on the omega-3s. Um, probiotics are also uh, potentially good, and it's not probiotics uh, as a supplement because probiotic is a category. You know, it's like saying, uh, you know, what supplements are good? What do you take? Uh, a probiotic, and then you just go to the store and you buy one. It's like saying, you know, uh, uh, what do you like to grill? Meat. Oh, okay, so you just like go buy like chicken liver. You know, right. chicken liver is not going to grill well. Sure. If you say, what do you like to take? Vitamin. Uh, the, vitamin is not a supplement. It's a category. So with probiotics, the, the thing is um, signaling again. So probiotics work on the signaling between the gut and the brain. Um, and they also work on production of certain amino acids um, and also on serotonin balance and also on inflammation within the gut. So if you have gut issues, the issue can either be in the small intestine or the large intestine commonly. It's less common to have issues in the stomach because the stomach is so acidic 
it'll just like burn any anything away that's bad. Right. But the small intestine could have some bacteria that don't belong there, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Your large intestine almost always has bacteria, unless you just got a colonoscopy, which washes away like 80% of the bacteria. Or if you get colonics, uh, colon hydrotherapy, which is not a good idea, um, you're gonna have bacteria in there. You're gonna have bacteria, you're also gonna have some yeast probably, um, and there's gonna be kind of a free-for-all. So what people end up doing, especially people with chronic pain, is they say, I'm gonna go take the supplement or the probiotic, which says it has the most evidence. And usually these are fairly safe to take because they've been studied a lot. But if you have gut issues, um, they're not necessarily safe to take because uh, imagine it like a party. Like, you know, you go to this party, uh, the party is like kind of weird, something's off, there's a lot of kind of crazy people there. That's kind of what your gut is like if you have gut issues. You don't know what's going on unless you get your gut microbiome um, sequenced by like Ubiome or American Gut Project or whatever. You don't know exactly what's in there. Then when you take a probiotic, it's kind of like, um, you know, the party was kind of weird, so you called the cops and the cops came. Uh, you know, do you think that's gonna make the party less weird or more weird? You don't know, you know, the cops right. could come, they could clear out kind of the miscreants and the hooligans and things are okay. But the cops could also make everybody like run for the hills and then like spill their beer all over the place. If that happens, a probiotic could make your stomach more upset or it could make your stomach not more upset, but in the long run, it could like take away the balance of certain um, existing flora in your gut. Sure. So really the safest thing to do if you have pain and gut issues is you get a supplement that has a really strong safety record, usually uh, one of the lacto-producing bacteria or um, one of the bifidobacteria. And there's not a ton of evidence on pain right now, but uh, we cover some in our research digest for those who are super into the science angle. But uh, when the studies come out, we, we cover them and it's usually like once a year. So uh, start with one of those. And then if you can, uh, pull apart the capsule and put like a fifth of the powder into a drink and then take it. So uh, that way you're getting a little bit and then your gut is getting used to, you know, one cop instead of five and then you add some every few days. And that's very safe. Now, if that ends up going well, then you can advance on to multi-strain probiotics uh, because it is good to get more than one strain of probiotics so that you don't have one that dominates or you don't have one that produces too much of something bad. Uh, like there's uh, something called D-lactate that certain otherwise good probiotics can produce in your gut if you have a certain gut composition. So uh, that's option number one, start small, get bigger, then get multi-strain. Another option is if you have chronic pain, you don't have gut issues and you, you never really had gut issues, just eat fermented food. So yeah. the advantage of fermented food is it tastes good uh, for most people. And fermented food has usually a lot higher levels in absolute terms of uh, probiotics, but it also has a higher variety depending on what's fermented. Um, and then also for, for most fermented things, um, you can take them as part of a sustainable routine. Usually for probiotics, when you run out in your bottle, then you either have to wait, you know, to get back on Amazon or you have to wait to refill your bank account or something. But if you eat kimchi, if you like spicy food or if you eat yogurt, if, uh, you know, if you eat yogurt, then you can do that indefinitely, you know, and it's just something you do and you're, you're just consistently getting high amounts of probiotics. So um, the mechanisms are not as important as the fact that if a probiotic seems to help your pain after like two or three weeks, just keep taking it because it's going to be safe. Um, and it's going to be more reliable than any one individual um, supplement pill. Man, nobody wants to hear the, the truth, right? Nobody wants to hear like, man, it's going to take just trial and error. You got to start small. Everybody wants that magic pill that's going to get them results overnight. Uh, but switching gears a little bit, um, nootropics is a huge topic of conversation right now. Everybody wants to hear about, you know, what do I take to make my brain work better? Um, what can I do right now to make my brain work better for today? And what can I take to make my brain work better long term as far as like neurogenesis type stuff? Um, let's talk about the three um, nootropics that you find have the greatest amount of um, research backing. So in general, I find that nootropics like strictly defined don't have a lot of research backing. And uh, the reason is that all the cool ones, like all the recetum class and all the Indian herbs and stuff, I uh, don't have that many human studies. The human studies are not well controlled and the results are mixed. That being said, uh, the best kind of brain supplements that I can think of are not usually classified as nootropics. So the first one is blueberries. And, you know, blueberries, they don't sound exciting because, uh, 
you know, they're blueberries, but, and you can't make a lot of money off of them because it's not patentable. Uh, but blueberries, um, when you look at what the best brain boosting supplements are, usually you don't look at healthy young people because the biggest trials are done in seniors with cognitive decline. Now, the disadvantage of that is it doesn't necessarily apply to younger people without cognitive decline, but the huge advantage is that the trials are much bigger and they're performed at much better research universities and they go on for a lot longer. And blueberries typically succeed in there. So I'd say, you know, if you wanna take a supplement, if you don't wanna just eat the blueberries, you can buy juice or pills, um, you know, that, that works. But uh, blueberries would probably outperform like whatever nootropic people throw up. Really? The second, yeah. The second thing I'd say is um, if you're using nootropics not consistently, but for periodic um, episodes, you know, don't get away from caffeine. It, just because, again, it's not hot doesn't mean that it doesn't affect things. Caffeine has a much greater um, immediate effect than almost any nootropic. Um, and for most people, if they if they feel too jittery, then you know, balance it out with L-theanine. Right. Uh, that's that's what green tea naturally does, and most people uh, tend to really like that. The third thing is, um, it's again not a supplement, but uh, I'm not. I'm not saying like everybody should go on a ketogenic diet, but one out of every, I don't know, 20 people who write to us, who I've talked to, um, who I've interacted with, like at the clinic or stuff like that, uh, when they get on a ketogenic diet, all of a sudden, like they have mental clarity, the same kind of clarity that people are similar that people do when they take right. modafinil. So um, have you ever taken modafinil or like Adderall or any of those things? Never. So um, here in the Bay Area, uh, tech guys. Everybody takes it. Yeah, they always start with that, right? And um, right. and I've taken some of that because of pain issues. Right. But, you know, like my doctors uh, have generally been of mindset. Like after a while, I I told them, you know, I'm willing to try all the crazy shots and injections and stuff, but um, like I I would like to talk about these interesting you know approaches. And one of them is when you focus a lot on your chronic pain that can make your mental image of that body part's pain larger. Yeah. There is a, a part of the brain that has a mental image of, of your body parts. And like, if you have shoulder pain, your shoulder could be really big in that mental image. So um, I thought, why not try Adderall or Modafinil or one of those? So I tried all of them. Uh, didn't help the pain, but Modafinil for a lot of people is a pretty good drug. Again, not something to cover on examine.com much because it's a drug, but Modafinil has a pretty good effect for a lot of people. Um, Positive effect without any negatives? Uh, not. Not with a ton of negatives, you know, it depends on, on the person. And also if you take generic modafinil, uh, people have had uh, kind of worse side effects typically. And that's because there's this common misconception that if you take the generic, you're gonna have the exact same effect because it's the exact same thing. And they're just bilking you out of your money, the pharma company. Not always, because with modafinil, the generics t uh, typically don't do quite as well. And also I just talked about the gut, uh, the main drug used to clear bacteria from your small intestine um, if you have an infection or uh, gut stuff there, is called Zyfaxin. And it turns out that the generic Zyfaxin uh, produced in India does not work as well. And it's because it's the same uh, substance, the same chemical formula, but it's not the same structure. And when you have not the exact same structure, uh, then you have problems. And in this case, it's there's more systematic, uh, systemic absorption of Zyfaxin than with the brand name. So uh, modafinil typically works pretty okay. I'm not saying everybody should take it and don't try to you know, trick your doctor into giving it to you. If you have ADHD, you know, maybe then trick him. But if you're taking it to boost your brain power, then then don't do that. Um, <laughs> you know, with your doctor, this is a huge thing I get for, uh, for chronic pain. So I, I used to run this meetup group in Boston and there was a huge span of people. So uh, there were only like three people who had ever lifted weights before, me and these two other guys, right? Um, and then there were like 20 women between the ages of 50 and 70. So it was like us and them and like two younger women. So us three, um, all of our joint pain started somehow through lifting weights. You know, mine was, uh, I was trying to get a little bit into Olympic lifting. I don't know why, because it was like six months before I was going to do my first powerlifting meet where you don't need to ever do anything Olympic related at all. But I was like, I've never really like practiced my form. So I started getting this labor and tear got worse and worse. You know, one of the other guys was the, the common archetype of uh, either from heavy squat or deadlift with bad form, hurt his lower back, can't get rid of it, had back surgery that didn't work. So 
So people who go to this meetup group, they've all tried all this crazy stuff, right? Um, and I have too. Like, uh, have you heard of ketamine? Yes. Uh, like ketamine, either as a hallucinogenic or yeah. as an anesthetic, or so. Um, I had a ketamine infusion um, where uh, they hook you up to a drip, um, and it, I had a ketamine infusion in the hospital. So they hook you up, they give you a ton of ketamine, um, and then. The only way to balance that out so you don't get a, a psychotic break is to, to give you Haldol, which is the drug that they gave in Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, so, you know, I, it, was, it wasn't a great experience. Right. I went into a K-hole. Um, you know, I came out hours later and then I like was drooling and couldn't really move wow. for about 20 hours. So um, it was a crazy experience, but... We had all tried crazy stuff like that. With the, with the preference of getting rid of the pain. Yeah, with the preference of getting rid of the pain. Because people will do literally anything to get rid of pain, right? Um, there's as many ways you can get pain as ways you can get happy. And uh, because of that, I can't recommend like one supplement for pain because there's all of these different facets, right? You could have an issue with signaling, like I said before. You could have an issue with muscular joint imbalance. You could have not enough joint tissue. Um, you could have some weird brain-related thing. So people have tried all these weird things, but what they haven't tried is um, is something that, I, I don't know, the medical system is not set up this way. People never go to like a physiatrist, a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor. What they do is they go to an orthopedic surgeon, orthopedic surgeon knows nothing but surgery, and then they're like, screw conventional medicine, I'm gonna go batshit crazy and try crystals and homeopathy. Um, or they're like, screw this, I'm gonna try ketamine infusion, which I did. Um, but they never try to find somebody who knows a lot about both the way muscles and joints work and nutrition. Yeah. So basically a combination of a PMNR doctor, so a licensed medical doctor, and you know somebody like myself who just uh, tries to learn crazy stuff about nutrition and pain. And that's not a job description. Right. That's the problem. It's not easy to find, right? It's not easy to find. So you know, moving on, as the director of uh, examine.com and... If you could give you know our listeners advice on the five most uh, substantially researched and most efficacious, it doesn't even have to be researched from your from your experience and your expertise. Um, what are the five most um, useful supplements people should be taking? Uh, let's see. If you lift weights, creatine. If you don't lift weights, um, maybe still creatine because creatine's obvious uses for muscle gain. Creatine's non-obvious use is for mental stuff. And this isn't like, uh, again, this isn't classified as a nootropic because it often doesn't have um, nootropic-like benefits. Like the proposed mechanisms for nootropics like increased blood flow between parts of the brain or uh, neurogenesis. That's not what creatine does, but what creatine could do is, um, like there's a pretty well-controlled study on creatine and depression a couple of years ago, and it, it helped major depression, which is a big deal. And the proposed mechanism was, um, well, there's a couple of proposed mechanisms. One is that if you have, uh, if you have depression, if you have some kind of cognitive issues, then your neural pathways might not be working in the same way that they did before you had depression or mental issues, um, cognition issues. So there are certain areas in the brain that are called rich club connections, where um, usually there will be uh, small pathways, narrow pathways in the brain, but a rich club connection is like a highway. It kind of links a lot of things together. And what creatine can do, because it increases um, energy output or kind of the energy threshold of the cell, is to increase the capacity to have these rich club connections. So creatine, if you're having cognitive deficits, um, potentially could be something that's awesome to take. And uh, creatine could also potentially help pain because both that and it could help you get through your PT workout. So uh, creatine is one. Uh, it's not the top one, this is just random order. Second is vitamin D. Um, so vitamin D is actually a little bit controversial at the moment because, so uh, in 2009, we started our vitamin D research. Uh, basically we were hired by the federal government Institute of Medicine to do the systematic review for the 2010 vitamin D guidelines. And what happened is we came out with our uh, research synthesis and they used it mostly. They didn't use parts of it because um, kind of like the, the dermatologist lobby is, is not cool with too much sun exposure. Sure. So, um, you know, they, they put the vitamin D guidelines pretty low, but it's really low. You know, 
it's safe for everybody pretty much to take a thousand IUs of vitamin D. Um, for vitamin D, the, the main thing for me is to think uh, ancestrally. So if your ancestors are from Southern Europe, let's say, if you have people from Spain, Greece, Italy, whatever, um, you might think about it a little bit differently than if you're all Norwegian or if your ancestors are near the equator. And it's partly to do with vitamin D and partly not to do with vitamin D. So the reason why people's skin color changed is, you know, to get more vitamin D as your skin gets lighter, then um, you can absorb more. But then when you got to a certain level, um, the population that ate the most um, seafood, or at least seafood liver, was the Inuit population. And they got enough vitamin D from their seafood that their skin didn't get as light as like Northern Europeans did. So really a lot of what you have to think about is not vitamin D per se as a supplement, but what vitamin D might be telling you uh, kind of ancestrally. And like what it tells me is this, um, you know, I live in San Francisco at the moment in a foggy neighborhood. It's not ideal, but I'll do things like take vacation a lot or get uh, infrared saunas or whatever. My vitamin D does not go up as much as almost all my friends does, even given the same supplement. And that's because of something to do with vitamin D genetics. So you have to get your vitamin D tested. Don't just take a supplement and be like, I took a thousand IUs of vitamin D, I'm fine. Get your vitamin D tested, there's no reason not to. Um, but if you have you know, some genetic background from anywhere near the equator, Southern Europe, then think about some other stuff too. Like uh, those people tended to eat different diets and uh, the nearer to the equator you get, the more plants people tended to eat. So that doesn't mean go vegan, but what it does mean is um, like there was just uh, some research a few months ago about, so uh, we've known for a while that people from Northern Europe uh, metabolize fat differently on average than people from uh, near the equator. So somebody from like uh, Northern Africa, when they eat plants, they tend to produce more long chain fatty acids from those plants than somebody from Norway. What that means is that uh, people who eat vegan or vegetarian diets from up north probably will not naturally get as much of the long chain fats from the plants. So conversion from flaxseed or whatever to usable EPA and DHA is already very low. But if you're from Northern Europe, if you have pale skin, it's gonna be even lower probably. Was that shown to be a genetic thing or a microbiome thing? It's a genetic thing. Um, so it's almost entirely based on genetics from what people know, but there's probably maybe an additive effect from microbiome that isn't known. So uh, there was recent research though, just from the past few months that we knew Europe versus like North Africa, but now we even know UK versus Italy. Hmm. Um, if you're from the UK, if your skin's very light, then your metabolism of fatty acids is different than somebody who's mostly from Italy. So uh, when it comes down to that, there's no real guidelines but um, it makes sense just to like, there's a pro and a con of like being from Italy. It's that if you're vegan and you're kind of darker skin, you're probably gonna extract more um, or, or make more long chain omega-3s, which is good. But if you're eating a crappy diet, you're probably gonna make more long chain omega-6, which is bad. Uh, and if you're very pale, then you know the opposite is the case. So. These are just things to think about, and it's kind of fun. Think back to what your great grandparents might have eaten, and uh, if they were like a lot of milk, a lot of meat, it doesn't mean you have to eat that way, but it could mean that your genetics and your microbiome is someone predisposed to that. Like, there's a decent chance that my gut microbiome is predisposed to eating less um, meat because my ancestors are from Western, Northwestern India where they've been vegetarian for longer than anybody else, like many hundreds of years. So I probably have different iron metabolism than, you know, Joe Schmoller off the street. So it's just something interesting to think about. But when you look at these kind of lists, like what to take and what has evidence, always think about it as it applies to you. So like the third thing, other than vitamin D and creatine, is probiotics. Because most people have kind of screwed up microbiomes and taking at least a decent probiotic or eating some kind of fermented food is a good idea. Um, but that doesn't mean just take whatever's most advertised. Like you really have to think about what people have eaten in your lineage before you, how you yourself have lived your life. Like if you have taken the antibiotic 
um, and then feeling really crappy and then taking a while to kind of get normal, you know something happened to your gut microbiome. If you ate uh, kimchi before and you felt bad, but it's not because of the spice, it could mean you have histamine issues. Basically that probiotic foods you take can produce histamine in your gut, which makes you feel bad. And that's one reason why some people uh, like can eat, for example, uh, smoked salmon. It's not because fish is bad or that aged fish is bad. It's that smoked salmon has high histamine levels. So this can get like really, really specific, but there's these caveats under each supplement. So uh, for probiotics, there's more caveats than almost anything. The fourth thing I'd say um, is vitamin C. And it's not that people don't get enough vitamin C. It's more so vitamin C could be therapeutic for things like pain conditions. Um, also, um, vitamin C is uh, a unique nutrient. So vitamin D is not a nutrient like all the rest of the nutrients. Um, it's not even supposed to be a nutrient. We all should be able to get enough from sunlight, but we live modern lifestyles so we can't. Vitamin C is similar. So a million or two year, million years ago, humans lost ability to make their own vitamin C. So uh, what that means on an evolutionary basis is we probably derive some um, evolutionary benefit from either eating foods that have vitamin C or something on that gene um, then gave us an advantage against malaria or something. But the key takeaway right now is that uh, we tend to get just enough vitamin C. Like people never get too much vitamin C and they only think about vitamin C when they get a cold. But vitamin C is very much like glutamine. So glutamine is not like A plus muscle building supplement. You know, it's not gonna provide much on top of your existing protein intake, but glutamine is intestinal fuel. So if you're uh, you know, an ultra marathon runner or if you're a competitive bodybuilder, then glutamine could be something that keeps you healthy when you're stressed out because your gut contains a lot of your immune system. Similarly, when animals are stressed out, um, when they're not stressed out, they might produce like a gram of vitamin C because they can make their own. Hmm. When they're really stressed out, then they could produce like 20, 30 grams of vitamin C. When humans are stressed out, then we don't make any vitamin C. I mean, we, we make it never. So when you're under a lot of stress, if you're traveling, it's not that you're going to take vitamin C and not get a cold, but vitamin C has almost no side effects, pretty much none. Um, and it's potentially lining up with this kind of a uh, physiological basis of vitamin C as a stress nutrient. At what dose, Kamal? What dose do you recommend You know, for someone to do? I know you said 500 milligrams earlier, but do you recommend any high dosing in any scenarios? Um, sort of. So uh, usually you titrate up. So similar to probiotics where you take a little bit and go up, vitamin C, the limiting factor is intestinal absorption. So um, when you take 500 milligrams of vitamin C, you'll absorb most of it. When you take 1,000, one gram, you'll absorb close to most of it. When you take a thousand and then an hour later you take another thousand, you're gonna pee a lot of it out. When you take like five or 10,000, um, it's called gut tolerance and that's when you have diarrhea. So uh, what kind of the vitamin C enthusiasts back in the day would say like Linus Pauling, uh, you know, different vitamin C doctors like Cathcart. Uh, I don't think all of what they say is right, but I think that if you take vitamin C, if you have a cold, think you might get a cold, just feel really stressed out because of long hours or hard workouts, take a thousand. If nothing happens, take a thousand again at some other point and then start titrating up, then go to like 2000 or something. Um, if you're really worried and you really don't want to get diarrhea, you could take liposomal vitamin C because it skips over that step of um, needing to use certain transporters for gut absorption. But liposomal vitamin C is also very expensive, so don't take it unless you have to. Amazing, man. How much are you concerned with um, quality of where these things are coming from? Uh, pretty concerned. So um, I, I've experimented with a lot of supplements, but I never take a supplement on a regular basis, which um, I didn't realize until maybe a year ago that somebody was surprised about that because uh, they thought either examine was anti supplements or pro supplements and were supplement shows, but you know, we don't make any money. We only make money by selling our information products and we have a staunch policy against associations or partnerships or ads. But um, I myself, uh, I don't take anything regularly because I've seen so many studies about things that build up bioaccumulation. So, um, like fish oil. Most people take pretty good fish oil, but if you've taken a bad fish oil, um, not in terms of oxidation, but bad in terms of like um, heavy metal content, 
that could build up very easily over the course of a couple of years. And all of a sudden you have heavy metal in your body that's not supposed to be there, that has very few studies on its outcomes. And you might not know where your symptoms are coming from for whatever disease. So I don't take the same thing every day because I've seen stuff like that, like, uh, you know, Soylent, the, um, the meal replacement that, that people take who don't like food or techies or whatever. Uh, that and one of the vegan protein shakes had some error where they ended up having something in the shake that was, wasn't supposed to be there. And some people use that as a, their sole source of food for a long time. Right. Um, I've seen things that are cross-contaminated, blah, blah, blah. So I only take a supplement if I, if I have to, if I'm experimenting or vitamin D in the winter. Everything else um, I take as simple as I can get, like, um, like magnesium, for example, I'll take the most basic magnesium by itself. Like, uh, you know, magnesium with no additives, no like flavorings or whatever. If I take, when I used to take nootropics, I would buy the bulk powder and I would cap it myself. Uh, and that's just being paranoid, but um, simple is good. You know, think about your body like a finely tuned machine. And if you feed it according to what a finely tuned machine is meant to be fed, you're, you're pretty good. But most people's bodies have broken down over the course of years because they didn't feed it what it should be fed and they put it in positions right. that are abnormal. So to fix it, you don't throw the kitchen sink at it like these supplements with these additives. You would throw in a little bit, you grab your Excel or Google Doc spreadsheet and you track your symptoms for a month. And if it's not working, you ditch it and move on. That way you save money and you don't expose yourself to unnecessary exposure. Kamal, you are a wealth of information, my friend. That was enlightening and uh, opened my eyes to a lot of things. I'm so grateful for you, man. Um, tell me about the new fitness guide that's coming out as we wrap up and where people can get that. Sure. So uh, basically, in 2017, the highest volume of emails we got is, um, I'm a 40-year-old guy. My body's starting to go to shit. What should I do? So uh, I would answer, you know, and then eventually I was like, uh, guys, can you have customer service, tell them that they can ask me any more questions because I don't, I don't want to be a dick. But then I was like, you know, we should make a guide about this. We cobbled together our existing information and we wrote step-by-step -step plans. And basically we looked at fitness, not in terms of like your one rep max or your VO2 max or your body fat percentage, but in terms of your bottlenecks, like what is preventing you from being fit? How can you treat that with supplements or diet? And we looked at the most important aspects from our systematic literature reviews. So usually it was um, muscle gain and fat loss, which were actually the two least important, but we covered them. Um, sleep, testosterone, cardiovascular health, and joint pain. And those were the most important things for that 40-year-old, 30, 50-year-old age group um, that they were lagging on. And we went through every supplement that has had a systematic review that we could find and we put their evidence as high, medium, or low. We put it as something you should definitely consider or maybe consider, only consider if you've tried everything else. And then we also separate it by like, if you're a man or a woman, if you're older or not older, don't take this if you have certain medical conditions. Uh, and we made a big step-by-step -step guide. So it's called our examine.com 2008 fitness guide. Um, and it's for people who want both step-by-step -step stuff and they just really wanna know exactly what to do about every facet of fitness dude amazing thank you so much kamal i appreciate it and examine.com you guys can get all the show notes at metpogolski.com slash podcast kamal patel thanks man no problem and that's a wrap ladies and gents if you love the show i'd love to have you share it we all know someone who's got chronic pain so go ahead and share it with them because they need to hear information like this from kamal and examine.com is an incredible resource before you go out and buy any any supplements do your research make sure the quality is the best um this is also why that i've attached myself to atp labs um, you guys know that i'm involved with atp labs now and uh, their products are known for being the most efficaciously designed high-level products that exist anywhere on the planet. And I love it. And uh, you will too. So if you guys want to get a discount, you can use code BEN10 at atplab.com. ATP Lab or ATP Labs, both will work. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, as always, leave me a review. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, guys.